Good day, everyone. I'm Anna Spitskaya. Welcome to our podcast, Sound is Perceiva. Sound is Perceiva is a new generation of classical music competition which offers contestants to perform in live broadcasts, television show style, from their own locations anywhere in the world. Their living room, their studio becomes concert hall in the virtual space. Sound is Perceiva panel of judges represents top performing artists and music educators from around the globe. Sound is Perceiva offers an unprecedented array of awards for musicians. Welcome to our live podcast, Meet the Judges, Meet Music Promoters, Music Managers, and Music Educators. We're glad. No matter where you are or who you are, music connects us all. We started with a dream, but now we are paving the future. Welcome to the Sound is Perceiva Global Competition. Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes, scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage. And today we have two distinguished judges, members of our judges panel, uh, come and join us for the Sound is Perceived podcast. First of all, I'd like to welcome back Robert Voisi. Robert, welcome back. It's such a great pleasure to have you on our broadcast. Hi, Anna. It's great to be here. You have been with us uh, a number of times, and um, you have developed um, several programs with us. You are a composer, and you're in constant search of new and better ways to connect newly written music and musicians to the audience, your own music and music of other people. You are a music and musician's manager. You organized a mind-blowing scope of events which help introduce countless people to the exciting world of modern newly written music. It gives people opportunities also to connect with producers, with composers of that music. Festivals, programs, shows, tours, websites, competitions. I can't even uh, finish listing all the endeavors you um part of. You're a leader in creating a presence for the composer's community and to those seeking newly, newly written music in the space of internet broadcasting too. Robert, please tell us about your ongoing project and how the shift to the internet broadcasting, especially the live broadcasting, shapes the work you do today. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, so, um, just to tell a little bit about me, I'm, you know, I'm a composer, a producer, and presenter, and I've uh, created um, the company Vox Novus in order to better present and empower the new music community, um, specifically uh, composers, uh, musicians that play uh, new music, and the multimedia artists that um, that work with us and, you know, use our uh, music. Um, in specific, I have a couple of programs that uh, do this. So one is 15 Minutes of Fame, uh, which is 15 one-minute pieces that are written by 15 different composers that are written for a specific musician or instrument, um, you know, to, to, to highlight both, uh, to give like kind of an eclectic view of, of what composers are writing and, um, and empower the musicians to to connect them with composers and also to show their virtuosity and uh, uh, let them strut their stuff. Um, another project I do is uh, Composer's Voice, which uh, specifically highlights uh, contemporary composers and gives them a platform to have their pieces heard. Um, the the shift into uh, into live performance. Uh, 
uh, online. Yeah, live performance. We are so used to performing in the um, physical spaces, but now you're taking the projects which had been so successful. You produced over 500 shows in 30 countries. You've taken this to really a global level in the physical concert halls. And um, now you're taking your community and your projects into the virtual space. How does that shape? How, do, how is it different? And what do you do? Well, it's kind of interesting. And, and I guess um, the, the one thing to say is sort of the, the writing was on the wall. Um, uh, obviously, live performances are important on so many different levels. Um, and it's, you know, it's almost hard to talk about. The, the difference between live and, and recorded is night and day. Um, and the, the necessity of the pandemic to put everything as live, uh, literally because the concert halls and the venues and the places that musicians and composers that would flock to um, are closed and they will be closed and they're not going to be opening for some time. And, um, you know, the, you know, the gap in work and sort of the, the, the lack of creativity that's going to be had, it's not, it's, it's just, um, it, it can't happen. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I saw that a lot of musicians were suffering and that's when I thought I would act in like sort of stream into uh, trying to present uh, this online. I went and checked out what people were doing, how they were doing it. And, um, and then, and then just basically took my programs to tailor them to, to help uh, musicians. And I guess that's where the first thing comes through is helping musicians. Mm -hmm. um, the, when, you know, the idea is to have, a great performance. We, we have a certain standards, um, you know, the public, we like to see what we like to see. And there's been a lot of like, uh, you know, generations and of uh, standards and, and, you know, what to expect. And what I found out is that, you know, we, we all have our specialties. And if you're a musician, especially if you're a, a talented musician, um, most of your efforts go into playing your instrument mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, they need to find gigs and do stuff like that and so forth. So, um, but all of that is live and physical and in halls and they like, they know like, Oh, okay. I need to get a gig here, here, here. This is like, we, you know, last year we did a gig at Carnegie, Carnegie hall. And of course everybody knows I like, Oh, practice, 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 you know, Get exactly. into Carnegie, and now you go. It well now Carnegie is closed, and will be closed for a while. And um, so now, what do you do? And there's the learning curve of trying to learn technology, and and it's a, it's a different industry in a lot of different ways. So that's how I've been tailing my program. I've been seeking people who um, are familiar with technology and understand the sort of rudimentary. Uh, uh, logistics at uh, being able to produce and present them and then going and finding those musicians who need this most and and want to get out there and uh, perform that is very interesting um of course there's a lot of uh, resistance in the musicians community um saying that well the learning technology is uh, another whole new area uh, why should I do that? Why would I have to do that? I, and um, um, why is that necessary? Do you believe uh, musicians uh, need, should, and have a benefit of approaching uh, their careers and incorporate differently, I mean, approaching their careers slightly differently today and incorporating the modern technology as a given part, which they have to learn, they have to uh, get on and uh, to be current? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that this this train has been rolling down the tracks for a long time. Um, you know, technology is here to stay, um, and uh, more and more, uh, the, sort of the social media, uh, video, um, all all the things that you know uh, 
people enjoy today are becoming more and more prevalent uh, in our society. Um, it's, I mean, basically kids and YouTubers and so forth come and they sit in their studio and they broadcast and they do stuff online more than they go out to clubs and concert halls, even to do popular music. Um, so I feel that um, sort of a resistance to it is not in their best interests. Um, and then the truth of the matter is, is um, you know, if, if you're a musician that has the sort of resources and, you know, are, are lucky enough to be able to wait out the pandemic, then I, I you know, God bless you. Um, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Most of us don't. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think that's it is just like, you know, uh, a lot of people feel like, oh, they're, they're waiting for everything to go back. And there's an interesting concept about going back. Uh, from last time I checked, history usually goes forward. Yes. Not so much back. Yeah, and I mean, just like, uh, sadly, simple statistics. The, the, the first is, is the venues aren't opening right now, um, whether it be because of decree or whether it be because of resources or, you know, uh, just common sense of public safety they're not opening and um you know and when they do there's risk there's definite risk that needs to be addressed so that's i i mean unless and once it, they, yeah and once they open um it doesn't um cancel the internet opening counter holes is not going to sound suddenly uh, dismantled the towers. Well, and, and, and still exist. And that's that's kind of so. There's so as this is going on, like you said, things go forward. So the thing that people aren't, I don't think, are factoring into their equations, or at least musicians. And I get it why they don't. But like, there are a lot of venues that are now weighing their options and like going, I'm closing, or mm -hmm. they're they're going to handle their business in a whole different way which may not even cater to musicians. So all that's going forward because they're looking at their bottom lines and they're trying to see how they're going to be able to survive until next year. And that doesn't even talk about uh, musicians and all the support crew that goes with them. M most of the people that I know, you know, they just, they don't have a whole bunch of resources that are like packed away in order to survive you know, a siege Be, for six yeah. months to a year. And stay inactive, yeah. And so what do they do? And I think everybody's expecting like, oh, they're going to come back. But I think that once that, that the sort of, you know, the, the pandemic kind of like obliterates them, like, let's take me for an example. If, uh, you know, I decide to go into accounting and, um, you know, finally do that and get welcomed up into you know, an accounting firm, once everything comes back, am I going to just drop my stable job to to go and start producing again? It's unlikely. Mm -hmm. And I, and and that's where I think that this is this is going to be the future. And like you said, technology isn't stopping. They're now all pushing forward. There's need the need is there. So all of that's going to go forward and just there there there'll be a people to fill that vacuum and that gap. And musicians can choose to be those people. And that brings me to um, welcoming uh, another guest of our program. Uh, please welcome Peter Askim. Peter, welcome to our podcast. It's an honor to host you. Thank you for making time to be with us. Of course, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. And, and congratulations on all the amazing things that you're doing. It's really forward looking and, and you know, we all need to be looking out for each other as musicians and, and I really commend you for putting this all together. 
Thank you. Peter, you are an acclaimed composer as well. Um, we have two composers here, and um, that is really interesting, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, the discussions. Um, you're also a conductor and a performer on your own instrument, leader of the orchestras and groups. Your music had been performed and recorded by greatest artists of our generation. You're a successful musician. Um, but not only, you're also a tireless music promoter, organizer of festivals and numerous events, ongoing festivals. Again, just like with Robert, if I start listing all the things you've done in the physical space for musicians and for the music industry, I'm going to be here until tomorrow. Uh, you are incorporating all this broader experience with the arts and performing arts in particular. Um, you're not shying away from taking leadership in administrative positions in the industry. And um, currently, I think it's really important for musicians to hear from people like you, Robert, and you, Peter, about what it is you are doing. Because many musicians and even managers find themselves very unprepared for the changes and the shifts which are happening. Um, yes, like Robert said, the concert halls are closed or working at a very reduced capacity and we are in that situation not for the couple of weeks as we can all clearly see. So the shifts which are taking root right now are probably um, going to be some major changes in how the industry runs. Please share with us about your projects and your philosophy behind running those projects and how you are shifting your focus and um, staying current with your projects in the changing situation. Sure, sure. Um, so there's a there's a few things that I do. Um, I'm a conductor and I com I'm a composer. And as you mentioned, I also uh, work to give musicians opportunities, work to make music happen. I think maybe in my DNA as a composer, what does a composer do? A composer makes sound happen through time um, and all of the things that it takes to make that work. Right, so it's not just putting notes on a page, but it's knowing the structures and knowing the the venues and the people and how the instruments work, but also how to get the music out there. So um, I'm also very much a, an educator, and I believe in the next generation of musicians. I had very generous teachers, and um, I feel not only obligated but joyful to to help the next generation of artists. So one of the projects that I've been most proud of is called the Next Festival of Emerging Artists. And this is now the eighth year that we've done this. Uh, for seven of the years it was a physical festival taking place in New York and in, um, in Connecticut, but focused on the next generation of string players and composers and choreographers. So bringing them together, giving them all of the pieces of the puzzle that it takes to make a career in music. So not just um, you know where to put your fingers at what time, uh, but you know how to think as an entrepreneur, how to think as a member of a community, how to think outside of the box, how to how to imagine new ways of making music. And so when the pandemic hit, uh, right away I wanted to be part of the solution. I mean everybody was canceling everything right away. Um, everybody was afraid, everybody didn't know what to do, and I felt like we were in a position to step in and try to help in whatever way we could. So right from the beginning in March, we started doing a twice weekly uh, feature. So we had master classes with really great guest artists that we would have students at home were able to do these remote master classes that were open to the public around the world. Um, giving the giving people something to practice for giving them the ability to have feedback from the best in the business um, reason to get out of bed in the morning and tune their instruments and then also um, very targeted informational workshops so finances what do you do with your finances in the pandemic how do you reimagine what it is to have a career how do you network in the pandemic all the way to, you know, what microphone should I buy? Because we know everybody needs a microphone, everybody needs a good camera, there's just no, there's no going back. Um, so what we wanted to do was be very, very targeted about that, giving people the resources that they needed, but also the sense of community that they needed coming together. We're all in the same boat. 
um, we're all sharing the same challenges. And so right from the beginning, we wanted to do that. We had a virtual festival that we did this summer that enabled our students from around the world to collaborate with composers and choreographers and dancers remotely to create something which was totally new in a new space. And it was important that we don't try and recreate what happens when we're all in the same room, but try and use this to envision something that's totally different that wouldn't be possible in any other situation. So that's a little bit about the festival. That's very interesting. You mentioned uh, instead of trying to recreate the physical um, performance, use the virtual counter hall space right. and create what's appropriate for that platform and right. investigate and open up and use its own specific possibilities. We had a program um, which virtual counter halls produced with the um, opera company in the Washington DC area, uh, Bel Cantanti. And um, the managers and musicians of that opera company also were actually praising the virtual space for the opportunities which it provides, which you can't really do in the physical space or it's uh, overly expensive, like, um, you know, visuals and the uh, um, and the lights and being able to invite musicians from uh, different parts of the world without having to uh, find funding for their tickets and without them having to take off um, time from their other jobs, um, teaching jobs or whatever other commitments they might have. How did you find that worked out for the festival which you had um, in the summer in the virtual form? I felt like actually this was the best year that we'd ever had. So we had, we were able to bring in 35 literally world-class artists, Pulitzer Prize winners, Gravemeyer winners, um, Grammy winners, and make them available um, to everybody f at a very reasonable cost. I mean, one of our priorities, of course, was to pay all of our artists because that's so important. Um, nobody was doing anything for free, but also nobody was paying to, to, to tune into this. And so we increased our audience by tenfold. We had um, people from around, literally around the world tuning in. Uh, we have now an archive on YouTube. Our YouTube channel has all of these workshops still available as a resource. So I feel like our kind of both the depth and the breadth of our impact was far greater than it, than it had been in the past. Um, I, miss the, I miss what we used to do and I want to do it again but I think that the two will continue to coexist because um, yeah in a lot of ways it was it was really extraordinary what we were able to do our budget looks totally different rather than paying for food and hotels we put that money straight into artists um, and incredible yeah I think it's important this is incredible and this is so important to uh, for people to hear from uh, your experience which had already happened because there's a lot of hypotheticals of course what if what if what if sure but um your experience uh, uh peter and your experience robert uh is not what based on what if it's based on the things which you have already done through the stages of, uh in the virtual space and and i think you know peter bring, brings up a point that's really important is it's not about replacing like live concert halls. I don't think anybody is really looking to do that. It's, um, it's about taking advantage of, uh, the opportunity and the technology that we have. And it, it hasn't been overutilized. It's been underutilized. And this is, this is the time now for everybody to get their feet wet. And while, while everybody is understanding, right? I mean, uh, there's, um, at the moment, everybody understands there's a pandemic. So the threshold is sort of, you know, when the cat comes in the background, you know, people are forgiving. <laughs> that probably won't be so in the future. Sometimes it's actually the highlight, you know, <laughs> because some people have very cute cats and we just didn't know that before. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We had, um, over the course of the 70 plus programs which Virtual Cancer Holds produced, and we had nearly 400 participants by now, we had just about anything, well, anyone, anything, uh, troll, waltz into our um, pro programs, including pet lizards, <laughs> which are <laughs> kind of cute. <laughs> 
And uh, I would like to also mention that Virtual Concert Halls is the company created by musicians for musicians in cooperation, of course, with the television uh, production managers and uh, pr professional producers and the software developers all around the world. Um, all in all, we stopped counting people who added their expertise and their time to the creation of uh, Virtual Concert Halls um, at, at 200. And um, this is the currently the platform which is providing the tech support to the Sound is Pursue competition and to all the participants who will take courage and um, decide to get their feet wet in this new realm. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's so important to, to kind of go what Robert was saying. You know, none of us uh, grew up with this technology. None of us went to music school and sat in a practice room or composition studio for six or eight hours a day, knowing that this is what we wanted to do. But everybody, I think this is so unique that every, literally everybody in the world was put in the same spot all at once. And there is a lot of forgiveness and there is a lot of gratitude, I found. Um, you know, we were just making things up as we go along. But people were so grateful uh, to have a, something to tune into and to be a part of and to feel um, welcome, you know. So exactly. I, I do think that that's really important. We, you have the you have the license and the permission to to have the cat in the background um, as long as you're being real and and providing something to people. No. Yes, those virtual opportunities are created with love, and they're created for people to have the platform to express themselves. Hmm. And I'm going to play a very short intro, uh, trailer about uh, the Virtual Concert Halls platform, and, uh, which highlights the beginning of how it was created. So we're together creating that new space, which is, uh, yes, it's more forgiving, it's more intimate. It uh, welcomes musicians and uh, audience into people's homes, into people's private studios. And um, to me, it creates a much more vibrant connection between musicians and the audience. And, and I think it is also, it's sort of addressing a connection that's been missing for a while, especially in uh, new music and contemporary music. Um, one of uh, my favorite uh, not-for-profit organizations was Meet the Composer. And um, they specifically gave money to, you know, grab the composer out of his studio, cave, wherever he's making music, and put him in front of audiences um, to have the audiences meet, to meet that composer. And maybe it would be, um, in a, a pre-concert sort of panel or introduction, or it might be just like after the concert, you know, in the green room or whatever. But it was a way for audiences to connect. And I think it's in, I mean, I don't know, Peter, if you agree with me or not, but it was, it was something that I thought was really missing um, in the new music community. Um, just like sort of a you know, outreach to our community. We were kind of us in our own enclaves for way too long. And like I said, you know, the technology being an opportunity. And I think that, you know, this intimacy that has been brought out where people get to meet your cats and like they're seeing, you know, inside your, your apartments or your houses or, you know, just like the, the all the, the, the personal details that make us like human and real people um, are starting to 
connect to audiences, which I think is very vital. Yeah. And I, I think uh, one of my missions as what I, what I do and with the festival and also there's, um, I have a couple orchestras that I conduct in North Carolina. One of the, the main things that I try and do is to connect that composer who's isolated with the audience. Um, I think that people who are writing music today have something really interesting to tell us and there's a lot of different voices and different perspectives um, and trying to connect those with people. You know, with, with so we do a lot of music exclusively by living composers with the festival and with my orchestras in Raleigh. We do a world premiere on every concert and we bring in the composers uh, because composers are real people. You know, we're used to thinking of them as kind of a little little statue that goes on the piano, but they're they're just like us and right. they have a unique perspective that that uh, really brings something to people. And I, what I found is that that everyday people who are not the new music community um, really welcome that. They really want it. Who are these people making these sounds? And maybe they're strange or maybe I don't understand it, but this is a real person with a real perspective. And so maybe I'll give it a listen in a different way. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and now that's, that's so possible with technology, you know, to have great composers talking to us. And you know what, one of the things that I found was that anybody is able to ask a question. Right. You know, so you don't have to go to an elite conservatory. You can just say, you know, I, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but what about this? And that, that kind of communication and connection, I think, is so important. And, and the barriers have come down in a lot of ways. I think we have to work to keep them that way. You know, but I think I think bringing the barriers down, I think, has been been a great lesson for all of us. I agree completely. And there is another thing, another aspect in the virtual performance and virtual connection of musicians and audience and people in general is this is a largely still unexplored area. And yes, we hear a lot about what we are missing uh, in the performances in the um, physical concert halls. And uh, of course, we know what what it is we are missing, but the physical concert halls are the type of a performance which had been explored and known, and we know every aspect of it, it's our comfort zone. However, the virtual connection possibilities are only now being discovered and rediscovered, and there is still a lot more out there which we don't know that can offer and how that can be uh, connected and how it can help. We are starting to hear from artists and managers and promoters like you two um, the um, things which the virtual concert performance can bring, which physical concert hall cannot offer. And that's a new topic I'm hearing more and more on our podcasts from people who had experienced it. For example, big concert hall can be quite dehumanizing because you have this tall stage which is brightly lit and uh, you know artists in there in a very special clothing with this very special makeup which looks good under robust lights and you have massive amount of people as an audience uh, out there on the back in uh, in the space which has the lights turned off and pardon me but they're not even allowed to get up and go to the bathroom if they need to and the virtual concert hall in the space is a, a totally different organization of the experience where people can have a drink or coffee and they can have a chat while watching the performance. And yes, they can go to the, the restaurant. <laughs> but at the same time, they're, they're not bound, they're not enslaved to that experience. So they can tune in and they can tune out any moment and they can turn something else if this particular program does not interest them. Mm. Well, I think that for me, this is the most exciting thing about, um, you know, being able to do things virtually and sort of uh, stuff being opened up. Um, one of um, so just talking about the evolution of technology, one of the projects I worked on is 60 by 60, right, which is 60 one minute electronic pieces back to back for an in entire hour. So there's 60 different composers. There's usually just a big giant clock. And as the minute goes, we have a different, um, uh, you know, piece that goes. Um, and there's a new composer, a new, new sound. 
And, uh, you know, the idea was to show um, audiences the, the, the great breadth of, like, types of music, styles, um, you know, different sounds and ambiances. And um, I, 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 I don't know if I would say that I was a great originator of, uh, you know, miniature pieces. I think there's a huge tradition over many, many years, and there have been several different projects. Um, but what I will say is that with the internet coming into a different sort of, coming into its own, and it's like teenage years, if you want to call it that, um, it, <laughs> it was great to reach out to a huge audience of composers and, like, and make that connectivity and being able to put out the call and be able to transfer pieces and so forth and just the technology of like when i when i first started the project um i think i was kind of laughed at by a lot of uh the the sort of mainstream producers of concert hall music they'd all look at me and be like what do you mean you're gonna put two speakers in front with a clock no, no, and and it was so foreign. But over the, like the ten years that I did that project, it became almost it almost became a no brainer, and like it became less and less to convincing audiences. Like, oh, this is you know, here's the the weird technological concept. People just got that. They were just like, oh yeah, 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 sure, I get it. Just like at home, you'd listen to a stereo and like and they were more interested in the content that is there. And I think that, you know, we're going to go through the same thing right now. There's a lot of, there, there are so many interesting things that can be done now that were just not really economically feasible for a concert stage, but now we can do them. And I think there's also going to be a lot more dynamic ideas uh, involving the audience and involving performers from around the world and and just technologies that people haven't thought of yet like oh wow i can do this and and it's it's much easier to do with technology than it would be uh, oh, with putting up the props, to manifest yeah exactly like uh, right now we have this beautiful background for our program just imagine putting this on stage uh, with lights and props and it's just uh, extraordinarily costly uh but the message behind the graphics is the same right right and i think it's i think it's a really exciting time for people to reimagine things you know i i i, I there's a lot of sense of trying to recreate the live music experience or recreate you know um, the, the way that things used to be and the, the way that we liked them but I, I find that that's going to be inherently unsatisfying all the time I mean you can you can stream concerts and I think that that we need to I don't think there's any alternative but um, you know I'm interested in working with composers and performers to find a new way of collaboration that is enabled by technology and kind of leverages technology rather than trying to use technology to poorly recreate something. So, you know, um, with the orchestras that I conduct, uh, I've been working with Lisa Bialava, who's a composer, uh, had a really interesting project called Broadcast from Home, uh, where she crowdsourced texts of people living through the pandemic. She took those texts and created these musical building blocks crowdsourced crowdsourced recordings of those uh, and then assembled everything in Pro Tools, in, in music software to create a, a composition that was truly collaborative uh, with people literally around the world. Wow. And that's, to me, that's so interesting. We, we With the festival, we had a composer collaborative with uh, choreographers and each person was in their own space and but it was designed for multiple cameras, multiple, you know, people who were outside at the same time as people who were in their living room and the juxtaposition of that, it, it just kind of brought a whole nother uh, level of experience to it. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the opportunity for people who want to reimagine those type of things is definitely there and the costs to entry are a lot lower 
too. Um, so I think, you know, I, I miss I miss being in a room and making music with people. I miss, you know, as a conductor, being able to give people immediate feedback and have that back and forth. And I, you know, I would be lying if I said that I didn't miss that uh, because that's very real. Um, but there are new ways which are completely thinking around that or, or not not trying to desperately latch on to something and, and hold on to something, but kind of let it go and say, if we didn't think that way at all, what could we do? That's incredible ed attitude and approach. If we didn't have the concert hall, how would we perform? That's uh, so empowering to um, engage the creative side. And we are, as musicians, we that's our profession, to be creative, to mm -hmm. create something which has not been done before, which did not exist before, in one shape or form. Even as a performers, we recreate the composition, reimagine it through our interpretation. And that is uh, the least of those. Mm -hmm. Composers and producers create shows and create productions which did not exist before they thought of them. And this approach, it really is to reignite our creativity and to make the most out of what technology can offer in its own right, as opposed to finding the conflicting points between physical, vice versa, virtual. Um, now what, what, you know, Anna, one thing that I just would want to add to that, though, you know, because I, I, I think all three of us feel very strongly that, you know, we need to, to be bold uh, and to reimagine and to uh, step forward with courage. Um, but I think I think, and w one of the questions that we had talked about is is you know what do people need to do these days? What do young performers need to think about? I think absolutely we need to be courageous and we need to be bold and we need to seize the opportunities which seem like crises. But I think we also need to to just acknowledge the 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 shock of what's happened to all of us, um, and that it's difficult. You know, I, I'm all for, you know, and uh, trying to every day get up and lead that charge. But it's 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 hard. And I think that we need to, to give ourselves um, some kindness um, in that, too. You know, Absolutely. To, to, to keep it going. It's all the things that all of the things that were easy before <laughs> every single thing, everything is harder. Um, and we just if, if we acknowledge that and give ourselves a little bit of a break you know, myself included, then maybe we, f we can keep going to be bold. You know, with that said, can I, can I plug uh, virtual concert halls a little bit? Please. Uh, so <laughs> I, appreciate it, that. yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's, I, I totally agree with you, Peter. It's just like there, it's a lot. It is a lot. And I think that there's, I mean, even, it's, it's hard to jump over hurdles every day. And um, so, um, you know, I've been working uh, with my programs, 15 Minutes of Fame and, and uh, Composer's Voice, with virtual concert halls. And what a pleasure it's been, Anna. And I, I just want to thank you for that. And I, because just, you know, um, it's one, it's, yeah, okay. So, you know, Peter, you and I and Anna, are like, we're, you know, we're motivated and we're, we're here to help and we're doing those things, but it's, it's a hard thing to push forward. And I think that it's hard for musicians and composers to understand like, oh, you know, we get it. You may not have the equipment. You, um, this may be something new for you. You didn't like, you know, get your background all set up or, you know, or, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's been a, it's been a tough day. And now you've got to like let people into you know your private realm of which you may not be ready for, and um, you know and 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 I guess you know there's there's help out there and like uh, you know in virtual concert halls it's been a fantastic team to put these things together and um, you know it's so I want to want to encourage everybody you know who who. You might be sitting there, like going, "Oh, this is, this is, the Espressivo might be something that I might be interested in doing." But you know, there's it's hard. Nobody's saying it's easy. Um, but what we are saying is that we're there for you, and 
you know, you know, we're judges, but you know, judges always seems like such a hard, hard term, but it's not. We we we're, we're just out there to you know to be able to connect people and empower you to move forward. Um, a judge isn't really somebody to hold you down; it's somebody to lift you up. Um, and so this is this is a great this is going to be a great. A, a competition. I'm really excited to be a part of it, and Virtual Concert Halls is doing a great, a great service to our community. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been wonderful to see um, people who really want to help, you know, and and have have stepped in to this moment and risen to the challenges. And so I, I commend I commend you on that, Anna. And uh, again, I don't see myself as a judge. I see myself who's may or may not have heard a lot more music than the people who are playing and thought about it and how do you how do you actually make things work um so if if i can lend that that uh those hard fought years of experience that i'm i'm happy to but i you know i don't i don't see myself as as holding some great <laughs> power within my hands no i think i think we're all here because we want to help each other and give each other a platform and Say, oh, you know, have you thought about this? Right. Exactly. And this is really important for the contestants to hear. I hope you are watching this program because um, you're hearing what the judges are looking for to accomplish during the competition. And uh, over and again, we've, uh, we've been doing these programs for um, a couple of weeks now. We invite the judges to come in and share. What are you looking for in the contestants? What are you looking to accomplish? And we hear again and again, these are phenomenal musicians, successful uh, musicians who had input in the industry, many different areas and a lot of experience. And yes, they can be very harsh judges, but that's not what they're looking for. They're looking how they can give you their experience, their expertise, everything they have, how, how they can give and pass it on to the contestants in the most supportive way. And that is incredibly um, incredible reunion of the musicians in the community behind Saudi Spresivo. Uh, we are not here to judge. We are here to offer ourselves to the contestants and our abilities to help them move forward. And one of the, and, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, uh, you yeah. know, one of the things that really appeals to me is, is I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, at this moment in particular, you know, what can, what can musicians tell me about being human right now through the, through their art? What can they communicate? How can we create that connection? I'm not interested in, um, you know, stunning, spotless virtuosity with nothing to say. I right. think that there's a lot to say now, and um, that's what I value about what I understand that you're looking for with this competition. Um, so, so I just want to underscore that you know, uh, there's this is not about editing. This is not about you know, presenting some kind of sterile product. This is about, tell, tell me something. You know, I'm, we're all sitting in our living room and we want to be connected. How, tell me, tell me who you are right now through your art. Yeah, I would, I'm, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Peter. I, I'm, I'm that person too. My thing is express yourself. Like whatever, whatever you want to express, I'm, I want to listen and I'm, I'm interested to see who, who and what you are. So we will be connecting musicians who are welcome to reach deep in their own heart, in their own talent, in their own vision of the arts and communicate it to us and to others in the, in the, in the best way they can. And that's the, as part of the support for that, we did not prescribe the repertoire um, the contestants can choose the pieces which mostly speak for to their heart and to their own aesthetics and <clears throat> it through which they can express their personality and their individuality the most. That's one of the um, important invitations. Uh, stop thinking prescribed repertoire. We're not judging you on being able to play Bach, Prelude and Fugue and Etude and a Sonata and uh, a contemporary piece all in one mix. Choose where 
you are, where your own personality is. And um, as you can hear from our judges coming over and again to our podcasts, your message, your humanity, your ability to connect with the audience and your desire to connect are the most important criteria for the Sound is Pursuer competition. And with this, I'm going to ask our guests to just to briefly uh, summarize a quick message to our um, participants, teachers, other judges and managers, um, the entire community of the Sound is Pursuer before we say goodbye to this program. Um, Robert, would you like to go first? Um, uh, sure. The, um, the go out and be bold, you know, and think about, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge landscape of lots of different things. This Percebo contest is, um, a group of very motivated, uh, individuals that are looking to push and empower the, the music field forward. And I can't think of a better bunch of people right now that's working with the technology like they're doing today. Um, they've just gathered a huge, fantastic group of judges and technicians and uh, people who are uh, motivated to empowering uh, new uh, music in general, the musicians, especially the musicians. These are the people that are uh, sort of translating the music. Thank you, Robert. That was a message which um, it would inspire me to enter. <laughs> uh, Peter, would well, you, well, you can. You can. Yes, I, <laughs> fill out the application now. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I'll consider that. <laughs> you know, well, as, but we just want to say, Robert and I, as judges, you know, we we won't be biased one way or the other. You know, on a, you know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You, and, and that's a good thing. You know, I, I um, we sh we should be clear too when we talk about like you know people who are going to come in. We there's no age. There's no age. There's no discrimination. Well, there's there's groups, no yeah. sure. There are age groups, but you know, it's not like. Uh, you can be a student at any time in your life. Oh, and it doesn't have to be students either. I mean, it's... it's Professionals are welcome too. Professional are welcome. Amateurs are welcome. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's... Um, there's a... Th there's a huge variety of people that want to express themselves. And, you know, the doors are open. Yes, thank you. And Peter... Um, can we put you on solo? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> did you see how I did that? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> magic. No, I would you just... can hear my voice behind it. Exactly, exactly. It we don't magic. know where it's coming from. but. <laughs> yeah, we had some people say, well, guys, did you recreate Harry Potter or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would just say, along with what Robert is saying, you know, that, that it's... Um, it's definitely a new uncharted time and that there's, there are definitely challenges, but there are also opportunities. And one of the things that I feel most um, moved about is, is that people are letting themselves be flawed but human. And, um, and the sense of community, I think, is really important these days. And uh, we just just try. Just try. I, we all need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. You know, when we when we don't have that performance, live performance, you know, it becomes harder to, to discipline yourself and to kind of practice for some strange, nebulous thing that may or may not happen. I know, I, to me, as a, as a composer, I had a lot of commissions that are postponed, and it, it's, it's very difficult to sit in the chair and to do the kind of self-examination that you do to that you need to do to improve or to create a piece of music or to prepare um, for a performance, but having something to look forward to and knowing that the people on the other end of it want to hear that, you know, it's not just you're just not sending it out into the void. This is this is valuable. This is a chance to 
to have a reason to play scales and, and tune the instrument in the morning and get out of bed and fight fearlessly forward into an uncertain future. You know, there is there is something there are people on the other end of that and who want to hear what it is you have to say. And so um, play those scales, practice that repertoire, you know, be bold, be, be daring and um, be human. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Robert. This was incredibly enriching and very empowering um, conversation for me, too. I need a reason to get up in the morning, too, <laughs> and to play my scales on this piano, which I love dearly. But it is challenging, and thank you for pointing out the humanity and the human challenge of that. And um, going forward, thank you for coming again, and I uh, hope we will continue. Um, I skipped half of the questions which I wanted to ask you. May I have your permission to invite you again and to revisit some of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to also thank our viewers, our contestants, other judges, music managers, the entire community behind Sound is Perceiva, and the team of the producers who are behind the scenes and who make these programs possible from the technical aspect of it. Thank you all very much and see you in